Okay, I will begin. Well, I'm um, just introducing the next speaker, Jeff Nees, and he is um, he needs no introduction. And he um, he will share with you some innovative ways of teaching foundation physics. Sure, thank you, Priscilla. <laughs> uh, kia ora, folks. Uh, so today we're just going to go over uh some activities that my colleague josh who has had a few presentations so far uh, and myself have worked through so josh and i are lecturers and one of the papers we teach is foundation physics uh, more on that in a moment uh, so let's talk about some motivation for this presentation and for using desmos which will be the primary topic today. Uh, so we've already done some interesting things with Desmos that sometimes overlap between classes. And I'll talk about this in a second as well. So we've got algebra, calculus, and engineering math classes. Uh, and as we use more and more of one thing, you notice when new features get pumped out and sometimes are motivated to try them out. Uh, in terms of kinematics, the topic that we're exploring uh, historically, I find this to be a difficult topic to teach. Um, from the student's point of view, it's probably the most difficult topic in foundation physics. Uh, it happens kind of early in the course, in about week three to four. Uh, and some of these students that come in may have not uh, studied any physics before. So that means that they didn't do any in high school. Uh, additionally, some of the students may uh, be mature students or have left school for uh, you know as little as a semester, but still any time away from mathematics uh, can take a while to get back into. Um, you know, two-dimensional kinematics includes concepts such as vectors and acceleration equal to zero. Uh, and so these can be difficult for students to grasp. Um, one note about everyone's favorite topic, the coronavirus disease. Uh, has sort of made everyone become a bit more agile. So our recent lockdown here in Auckland, we had less than one day notice to switch to online teaching. Of course, we had a few go rounds before that uh, to transition to online teaching. Um, and I think as many people have already mentioned uh, in the couple days here at Delta, you know, it can be difficult to get the uh, active component of interactive. So you can say something is interactive, um, but I think a lot of teachers find that uh, the teacher is hyperactive or overactive uh, and the students are underactive or even passive. And so it can be difficult to, to bridge that. Some teaching context for these classes, this is a bridging program. So it sits between high school and a bachelor degree level. And in New Zealand, that's level four. Um, for these students in first semester, they'll take physics. That's what I'm talking about today. And this class is uh, classical mechanics or uh, basically uh, motion without calculus. And they have some math in here as well. And then in second semester, if they do a full year, they have more math and some more physics. And the goal is that they will move on to degree level. In this example here, this timetable is for an engineering student. So they'll move on to that in, the, in their second year. Here's what our classroom looks like. So we have uh, a lab classroom and we have a relatively small classroom. The max size is about 35. And we teach, uh, the students are grouped in these pods. You can have five students at a desk and then each desk has its own monitor and there's a micro PC as well so that they can uh, log into anything that you've got going on. And our philosophy is, basically that we want to have some lab activity in every session. So rather than split between labs and lectures, uh, we try to have the students doing something uh, in every session. Of course, if it's online, then it's going to be different than that. So here's the problem, uh, just to maybe refresh your memory, but we don't need to know what's happening here. Um, but the idea is just to get an idea from the from the student's point of view, looking at the algebra, this can be quite intimidating. You know, if this is again only their third or fourth week studying at university, and as I mentioned, they, they might have been out of university for a while if they're coming in to upskill, um, or they 
might be in our program because, for example, they haven't been exposed to physics in the past and you need physics in order to get into engineering. So that might be a reason uh, why they're here. Uh, so in one dimension, we're just going to you know, look at up and down uh, or left and right, uh, and then we extend it to two dimensions. So the hypothesis here is that Desmos, the software program, can be used to improve student comprehension of this topic of kinematics. And the goal is going to be uh, to demonstrate a tool that may be helpful with this difficult topic. So let's have a look at regular Desmos. So here's some things we can do with regular Desmos. And personally, I think it's a brilliant teaching companion. So I'm just going to swap screens. Uh, so here's something that we can do when teaching uh, trigonometry. Uh, and we have a unit circle and we can map out the triangles and get it to trace out, you know, or uh, draw for us a sine wave or define what a sine wave is. Uh, and this could have a lot of crossover in, in many different papers. In ours, we just touch on it quickly uh, to get to move on to the physics stuff. But we uh, bring this up to talk about radians. And you can see some notes in here. Um, you know, coordinates of a point on the circle, and then you can put another note in here to click the play button. All right, uh, so you can pass this link out to students and they can see how it's happened and you get like this nice visual uh, visual effect. And of course, it's much better than what I can draw on the board or on my tablet or, you know, anything like that. So here's another example. Uh, this one is just going to calculate the area between the axis and the curve. Uh, and actually in this one, we're not even, uh, we're not even going to estimate it. We're just gonna ask Desmos itself to do the integral. Uh, and so going through here, we can see that the value is negative and you can you know, do all of the interesting uh, exploratory questions like it is. And we see when the students look at this, you have the option of hiding the calculator section, uh, but in order you know, to press the button and change some variables here, we can change the right-hand boundary. Uh, you need to open that up and play around with it. So I do think this is good. And this is part of the motivation to trying to get a projectile motion or a kinematics problem up and running. And so here we can see one that uh, Josh and I developed uh, this past semester. Uh, and so going through here, here's this message I was talking about so you can if the students read through this, right, if, then they can say, oh yeah, click the play button to animate the point. And we can see the path that a projectile is going to take. And this activity is trying to uh, introduce the concept of range. So this horizontal distance based on our angle and our initial speed. And so we can change the initial speed as well. And so it comes out much slower than our path, you know, is a smaller parabola and the range is much, much lower. And you can kind of have fun and get both these things moving at the same time and it gets dreadfully confusing real quick. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons uh, why we moved on to a sort of a different activity. Um, that point, I just mentioned it about, about it being confusing. Here's, here's an iteration that's a tiny bit better. Um, we noticed that students had problems with vectors and the vector components. So in this one, we're overlaying uh, the horizontal and the vertical velocity vector components. And so that red line, hopefully it's smooth on the stream, that red line represents the tangent, which is your total velocity. And then you have the two components, you know, and one of the concepts that's tricky for students is right here, where at the top of the motion, uh, your velocity is entirely the horizontal velocity and your vertical velocity is zero. So that can kind of be illustrated here. But the problem is this computation panel on the left, look at all of this development that had to go in to produce uh, you know, this slick looking parabola, including a cannon that can, uh, that can rotate. Uh, and so really, uh, you know, it's good up to a point, you know, maybe good for demonstrating, but not so good for learning. Uh, and that's because the students are exposed to something that's more complicated than needs to be 
in order to learn the topic. Uh, and if they start looking at this straight away, uh, they're going to get intimidated uh, and, and that's not going to entice them to explore. Additionally, if they change a symbol, so you can click in here and type, uh, then it will be more difficult for them to go back. So that uh, spurred us to look at uh, what I'm calling Advanced Desmos, which is a completely different platform uh, accessible at teacher.desmos.com. And like most student teacher platforms, they have like a teacher view and you can assign activities and homework and they have a student view where the students uh, get a different side of the activity and then can submit answers and the teachers can provide feedback. So students can be assigned work and complete it in their own time, you know, which is nice for it being homework. Um, for what I'm talking about today, we actually, we did this one in real time in the classroom. So we still assigned it to students. Uh, the students do need an account and they do need to log in. And we are in these pod groups. So only one student logs in and then, you know, up to four or five students sit around the monitor and play around with it. So this is a 1D example. So here it is. And you get a little preview here of the screens. So I'll just go into the student version. These are some of the questions we want the students to explore. Uh, so how does the size of the initial value influence your throw? You know, what does positive and negative change? What direction does gravity work in? It's one of my favorite questions. Uh, how does the size of gravity affect your throw? And so on. So this is in this particular activity, what they're going through. So it can be relatively short and I'll go through it in about one minute. Um, so here, what we're doing is we're gonna estimate how fast we can throw a ball and then we're gonna click submit. And we can see some output on screen. And we say, well, 10, maybe I can throw 25. And the output's going to be more. And we have a range or a height value here. Uh, but this graphing calculator that we're looking at is static, OK? And you cannot go in and modify the formulas. The only thing you can modify is uh, the boxes that you set up. So next up, we want to put in some negative velocity and see what happens. And so this is like throwing something down off a cliff. Uh, and so obviously you don't have any uh, uh, peak value there that you can pull out, but you can still plug in, you know, plus two. And we might have seen it go up a little bit before it went down. Uh, we can now change the acceleration. And so what Desmos is doing here, they have something called a computation layer in the background. And it's kind of like their own scripting language. And so what you're going to do in here is if I type in 9.8 for gravity, uh, that's going to be linked to one of those variables in Desmos, or if you're familiar, it's called a slider. And uh, so the students don't get to manipulate the slider other than typing in a value here. And we can put in some velocity and click submit. And we say, well, what happened there? You know, it just kept going up. Uh, and eventually the students will figure out that I needed to put in 9.8 negative in order to get it to go down. Uh, same thing here. How can you simulate dropping? Well, we have to put in some gravity, remembering the negative, uh, and then we need to put in an initial velocity of zero and watch it take off. So I think this is a step up from our previous calculator version. And one thing about this one is that if we drop something, you get the feeling that it's accelerating, even though uh, it's not true physics. You do get that relationship that you're looking for. So that's a one dimensional activity. So we did this one in class and, um, you know, you could allot, say, as little as 15 minutes to it or as much as maybe 30 or more if you have chatty students. And I'll talk about some feedback in a second. So here is the two dimensional activity, which would be the following week. After some practice problems, we would come back and you can see a preview here. So I won't click through that one. I will go back now to my PowerPoint. Okay, so regular Desmos, advanced Desmos or teacher Desmos. Um, so just to wrap things up, the benefits that I, I found is that my students were discussing things on their own Whereas often if I try to provoke discussion, it can be a one-on-one -on -one where even though I'm asking one student or asking someone to volunteer, uh, it's just one person talking. But if I, if I sort of do my hands off thing and let them go at it, which means that they're clicking through and trying different values, uh, 
then between them, they're, they're discussing rather than having me guide the discussion. Of course, in the background, right, those screens, um, the prearranged activity is guiding the discussion. Uh, students go at their own pace. So, you know, I had one student sort of click through everything in 10 seconds, um, but then slowly make their way back through to the beginning and start going through them. You know, they wanted to see what was there. Uh, difficulties, whoops. Difficulties here are that it's another widget to master. Uh, personally, I found the computation layer not very straightforward, and at least it took me longer than I wanted it to in order to figure it out. I had to copy examples from other people and sort of modify them. Uh, you're at the mercy of the tech. So Desmos is pretty well supported and has been around a long time. So that's a positive. Um, but if something changes, you have to keep up with it. Uh, and so once you publish one of your activities, that's it. If you make any changes, you have to go back and republish it and then alert your students again of what has happened. Okay, so what did the students think about this? So uh, we asked the students a couple of short survey questions um, about their experience with these activities. You know, this was at the end of term. Uh, so this is a summary of the feedback. Uh, it was easy to learn by seeing the motion visually, which of course is exactly what we wanted. Um, but it was somewhat difficult to know how to use Desmos. So that, again, that's a less positive thing, but perhaps if they're using it in other classes, then, uh, you know, the learning gradient uh, is a little bit easier for them. So I've used Desmos in my other classes. So depending on their, their lectures, you know, they might see more or less of Desmos and depending on what classes they have concurrently. Uh, and Desmos is very helpful in regards to viewing, again, visualization, uh, and being able to do it on their own time at home due to COVID. So in conclusion, uh, the students and the lecturers found it helpful. And, uh, you know, all we can do is iterate and uh, improve and do it again next year. Um, looking at turning the vector example I showed you into um, a teacher Desmos activity. So uh, if you're interested in any of these links, I will post them in the chat. Uh, and so all the teacher Desmos and regular Desmos links are, um, I don't know, I guess public or open. And so you can click on them and see them. You can copy them and you can modify them on the spot. So here's a link to everything Josh and I have from this presentation. Um, otherwise, you can contact us directly if you're curious about that. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and sounds like a lot of work, Josh and Jeff. Both of you have done a lot um, with this online shift to online teaching. So I, I don't, wow, did I hear that it was less than a day notice? <laughs> you guys did well. Oh, I yeah, I'm not sure we whipped that up in less than a day. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't have any of this stuff ready beforehand, you know, you can't do much if you have to pivot quickly. You're kind of stuck with what you've already done in the past. Yeah, that's good that you're organized in that way and, you know, prepared for this online teaching. So any comments, any questions? Uh, there's some comments written during the presentation. Do you want to speak to that? Anyone? Uh, I would like to say something unless Heather has, uh, she has to write hand, uh, she writes her hand first. I don't know. Okay, go for it, Heather. Sure. Unmute. <laughs> Actually, really good. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Thanks, Heather. And, and um, uh, I worked with Jeff. So in fact, um, students are being exposed to Desmos and some of the maths papers now too. Um, which is really good. And we've got Priscilla um, a little bit in the problem solving paper. And I think it would be really good if we actually perhaps did a little bit more in the problem solving paper. Um, we have a little unit we do on linear programming. Um, and there is already set up some demos. Um, so in Desmos, there are some demos for teacher um, driven um, uh, displays and everything so uh, perhaps we can set up some of our own because it is actually a really good tool um, I quite like this yeah that's a that's a good point um so 
it's pretty standard these days, I guess, with things like this, but Desmos has like, a, I guess, like a library, right, of activities that other people have made. Yes. Um, and so and once you get into it, yeah, good idea to look at those. And even from a less mathematical viewpoint, because you can also import images into Desmos that perhaps we can actually build some sort of design, design come computing and um, uh, uh, um, problems um, into Desmos for students to consider as well, so. Yeah, so there, I mean, people get real creative with this stuff uh, and. Uh, I, th I think that's just it. Lots of students actually enjoy it to be, whilst you set up something, when the students are going through it, then it's actually student driven. They're going at the pace that they want to and they're thinking about things <laughs> and they can chat to others about it. Um, so it's a bit more student centered. Hey, thanks, Heather. Um, so, Carlos, do you have a, to have a question or a comment? Yeah, thank something? you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it seems that it's crazy that you just had one day notice and all the work that you have done. Uh, it's fantastic. And, and I was about to ask you when you were showing us the first, uh, the first version of the activities, and I was about to ask you, how do you manage, uh, you uh, get to explain all the uh, annotation that you have on the set and then you just switch to this more user-friendly for the students, which is, I think it's great because they don't have to worry too much of, of the technology behind, but at least just focus on the maths, which uh, I think is fantastic just to focus on that. And my question for mm -hmm. you is if you are thinking also like including not only these uh, animations on, on the computer, which are, help a lot, but also a little, maybe a couple of experiments, physical experiments that you can do uh, just for playing a little bit around with uh, free fall, for example. And then now with the technology that we have with the like cameras and all, all that, that kind of stuff, we can make a little, uh, some, some guesses, some experiments using this new technology. Have yeah. you, have you used, have you used FeeFox? I don't know if you teach physics or not. Uh, it's an app that uh, connects into all the sensors in your phone. And mm. it's, it's absolutely uh, fabulous for this, for this sort of thing. You're right. And you can get real good data um, using the accelerometer on your phone. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, you know, students love using th their phones. And so I try to, to encourage it. Um, it I, I haven't necessarily connected from real life experiments into a Desmos activity. Um, one thing that uh, Josh did with the two-dimensional activity was have them sort of like map out a table of values. Uh, and then as you type in the data, it plots it on the graph. Uh, and then, uh, you know, from there, I suppose you could try like a curve fit or something like, like that to see what the, what the path is. Um, but uh, I also recommend if anyone's interested in, yeah, uh, sort of collecting data and using smartphones, look at this app called uh, FeeFox. Folks, uh, good. Yeah, I haven't heard about it, but uh, I think that will be also including an extra uh, kind of a representation and an extra, mm, I don't know, like lab a little bit also to make sense of what they're doing with the physics, which I, I have uh, a few years ago, I remember uh, working a little bit with uh, acceleration and how free fall works with basic uh, with the basic questions of uh, motion. And I, I, I remember that students struggle a lot to understand these that how acceleration was changing over time per second square, that, that's, that was kind of hard. And looking at the uh, animations or vectors, that kind of helps you know, a little bit. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. I'm not sure if Josh wanted to add any comments. No. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I'm I'm just learning a lot now, and there's some the links are also put in the chat. Those of you who are wondering um, where to find these teaching activities, and it's really great to hear innovative ideas for teaching. Um, and um, I think any more questions? Just one final question before we wrap up. Okay, we'll. 
Thank you very much, Jeff and Josh, um, for your presentations. And um, we'll yes. just have a break before the next speaker, Phil. Okay, thank you very much.